Kevin, I see that you're raising your hands. If you don't mind, I'm going to let you off mute. So you're aware that you're off mute. Do you have a question already? Maybe not. If not, I will um, remove you from the panel. And you are free to ask any question in the Q&A. Um, maybe a quick introduction from my side. Uh, I would like to wish you a very welcome to our first webinar in regards to FinOps. We are joined by Stan de Pril, who is one of the leading FinOps people uh, with a lot of knowledge based in Belgium. And Stan will be joining us from a technical and business point of view and will give his insights on how you can turn cloud chaos into client success. Stan, the floor is yours. All right. So thank you very much. I hope everybody understands me or can hear me. Um, otherwise, uh, you just raise your hand or you uh, pop a question inside the Q&A. Pop it inside the Q&A because the chat we cannot download afterwards. So that makes uh, potentially um, unanswered questions easier to download. So with no further ado, um, from cloud chaos to client success. And um, who am I? I'm Stan de Pril. I'm, um, as Dan said, um, working in the FinOps area of cloud, uh, which means that everything related to cloud cost is something which is my bread and butter, is something where I'm 100% uh, uh, dedicated to. And um, why from client chaos or from cloud chaos to client success is because in every customer I come, um, there is some sort of chaos. Huh? And um, I really want to make sure that um, cloud brings the value that uh, is promised by everybody. Uh, and uh, the, the money part is a big, big part of this. Back in 2018, I've been triggered by, by the idea of FinOps when VMware, where I used to work, um, bought Cloud Health. And Cloud Health is one of the tooling vendors inside that area. And um, I was working at that time, the Dutch customer, um, and that Dutch customer was reversing his whole cloud uh, environment back to on-premise, which was a very good deal for VMware, but a, a very uh, wrongly managed project for the customer. Of course, that's the cloud chaos and that stays in chaos at one point. So we are there to hopefully create some more control, some more insights into that. Now we have a full packed agenda for today. Um, we have the why FinOps, what is um, FinOps and uh, also um, how to start with it. I think everybody on this call um, should know where to start it at one point. But of course, uh, I've, been, I've been doing this for almost three years now. Uh, for four years even. Um, so we need to watch out for these pitfalls. And I, I've had, I have eight pitfalls that that we can um, the, that I will address and we will uh, run over them, um, every single one of them, and try to give you an answer um, that is uh, necessary. We also have a small portion of Q&A and then a wrap-up, which wraps everything up that we are talking about today. Now, no further ado, why FinOps? And this is, if I come to a customer and if I talk to a customer, Every single customer has give or take the same problem. And they might not have the same problem in, in with all of those five tiles, I would say, but they one way or another, they have one of these problems. Um, cost visibility, look at the person um, running on this pier. At one point, if he doesn't look out, he will fall into the water and he will not know where he is. So we need to swim back to shore, which is an issue, right? If you as a customer don't have any visibility on your cost in cloud, you're basically like that person at the end of the pier trying to find your way back to shore. Look at the plastic bag at the bottom. Waste is a big problem. Um, you can take a guess maybe in the chat uh, on um, how big this problem is. So let me pose you one question. If I would spend $100 in the cloud, how, how much of a percentage is waste? Could you drop, give you five seconds in the chat and then you uh, drop it in the chat um, and then uh, uh, we can hopefully see a couple of answers. Um, 35, all right, Katrin, thank you very much. 2%, that's uh, very optimistic, Kevin, that's very optimistic, it's 32%. According to Gartner, it's 35%. So Katrin was very close. Uh, according to Flexera, in a survey they did a um, couple of years back, I think it was in 2000 and, uh, 2022, I think they did a survey and these, these were the numbers that came out. Of course, at this point, 
we are growing in the cloud, so potentially the waste is just extrapolated with the growth in the cloud. Which brings me to my third tile, uh, which is a fear of using cloud growth, um, using clouds um, um, at, at, a, at a bigger scale. Huh? Um, you see these, these, these money piles, uh, these, money, uh, these money coins pile up. Um, of course, if you have a 32% problem, and you go from 100 to 1,000, you just multiplied your, uh, your problem by 10. If you don't control the waste, you just multiply your problem and extrapolate your problems to uh, times 10, basically. If you look at the no alignment between teams, uh, you see now here a very friendly photo of everybody that is aligning and doing, uh, doing some sort of handshake. Um, in many cases, that alignment of teams is not there because we were not used to doing that. We were not used to aligning... Um, Teams to technology, for example, of course, IT teams, they might have been in one way or another aligned, but in many bigger customers, you see, um, for example, the virtualization team throwing uh, a storage question over the bench or over the over the fence, sorry, and hopefully somebody takes the, takes the problem. But of course, now you have a bigger problem because you have clouds, you have your business that is willing to invest in clouds, but you might not have the technical resources there to support it. That's one. Two, if that technical resource is not there, how would you be able to link it back to finance where you have at least three actors in this game, the business, the finance, and your IT teams, your technical teams that need more alignment, need to get closer together, need to talk the language of cloud and also need to talk the language of FinOps. And then um, as the picture, I think everybody comes to the same conclusion. Uh, that, of course, there is an invoice from hell, and the invoice from hell is basically burning money. Uh, I think nobody wants to burn money at all. Um, and if you do, you can just send the money to me. That's all fun and games. But the invoice from hell is something that is very much there. I mean, the invoice from hell I see, for example, recently was one of the customers doing stuff with AI. Um, what happens in that in that uh, in that project is they created themselves an eleven thousand euro problem over one weekend, and we had one one bigger weekend uh, in uh, in August. In that weekend, nobody was really looking at the at the cost nor at the services. So what what have they done? They just uh, started a cognitive service a service uh, um, inside the cloud, which was doing some uh, some modeling, and all of a sudden they ended up with an eleven k invoice at the end of the at the end of the month or an increase at least on a project that was not really funded. So it was a proof of concept sandbox alike project. So all of a sudden 11K problem. So who is gonna pay? You can go back to uh, to AWS and say, hey, I didn't like these cognitive services from uh, from you, but I mean, if uh, AWS don't want to, doesn't want to support you, they will just say, yeah, well, it's your problem. You just run it and we provided you the service. And so they are in no way obliged to give you a refund. Of course, they do it from time to time, but they are no, in no way obliged to do it. So these five things, they sum up why FinOps is a, is a big, big topic at customers. Of course, if we zoom in to a bit, bit of more reasons why, um, we also need to zoom in uh, to the to the uh, the service provider that um, that that are pushing also on these on these services. If you look at this, um, the well-architected framework, for example, was back in 2016. They are already pushing on the cost. Uh, so the cost pillar in the in the well-architected framework was included the first of November 2020, 20, 2016. It was included back then. Back then, it was uh, rather small. Right now, it's an extensive um, how you could control costs. What we are going to talk about today is the umbrella above it, which is the FinOps framework. But these are uh, a lot of very good snippets inside that uh, well-architected framework um, from AWS. For a long time, they have been leading in this in this space um, where the others were uh, were less uh, less leading at this point they still um, have a big uh, role to play and are still pushing pushing the boundaries on uh, on this topic so um, if you want to know more on how to do it in aws there is a, a whole cost optimization pillar inside of these well architected frameworks of course they also push on on, uh, on optimizations and assessments and migration acceleration program and the map program or the OLA is also stuff where they really push on the benefits. Eh? Of course, the migration acceleration program, they push on moving stuff to the cloud to reduce your cost. 
what I've seen in the past and, 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 and still even today is when you move to the cloud, you don't control the cost. You are ending up in a conversation on why the on-premise is better compared from a costing point of view compared to the cloud and so on and so on. If you control your cost from the beginning, that's of course the ideal scenario. AWS optimization, so the OLA and uh, so the optimization and licensing assessment, you see there already a push on the right sizing of your resources, looking back to the 32% problem that Gartner uh, has found and 35% and of Lexera. This is where that money is. And, but also, of course, other mechanisms are in place to um, yeah, right size it, to reduce your cost and to be open for a uh, for, uh, more um, yeah, flexible usage of the cloud, right? All right. With no further ado, this is something that was presented back in, in 2023 during reInvent. AWS reInvent is a big conference in Vegas. And the CTO of AWS, he presented seven, or seven laws of the frugal architect, where um, in this case, you see a couple of laws, but all of them actually have an underlying cost uh, foundation. Eh? Of course, the first one is make cost a non-functional requirement of every design, every architecture you make. Of course, system that lost uh, that lost align uh, that lost uh, that stay align uh, to the um, align cost to the business. Architecting is a series of trade offs, including a cost trade off. Unobserved systems leads to unknown cost. If you don't know which systems are running, they are unobserved. So then you just yeah, lose control of your cost. It is not about savings. You will see it later on. It's about controlling the costs and making sure certain dollars don't need to be spent in the cloud. Uh, cost optimization is incremental. If I save 1,000 euros today, it is also 1,000 euros tomorrow or next month or the year after. If I see at customers, um, for example, a real big push on, uh, on 1,000 euros, I most of the time push them back and uh, talk about avoidance. And I have a, a nice slide later on, but... That's something I think is, uh, is even more important. And then, of course, unchallenged success leads to assumptions. If you don't challenge what you are doing, you can lead to certain assumptions and also cost assumptions. Technical assumptions, of course, of course, we, we have a, a better way of dealing with all those technical assumptions. We have a very bad way in general to deal with all the assumptions from a costing point of view. And I mean, Assumptions are never a good idea. You should always try to prov uh, prove it in data. Run it through a cost calculator with AWS. Make sure that the right resources are on it with the right size. And you at least have a good idea on your monthly cost. I think that's super important for, um, for, um, for everybody on this call. Um, these seven laws, you can read it, the frugalarchitect.com, if I'm not mistaken. You can read through the uh, whole list of uh, yeah, more explanation of this. So AWS is leading the pack. Uh, in this, but of course, there is more reasons to to um, to this, and why we are talking about the FinOps framework. And one more reason why is, of course, AWS is one of the bigger players in the in the cloud world. But the the FinOps framework is also supported by Microsoft and by Google, which I believe is a is a big step forward in um, creating um, a uh, a homo uh, homogeneous way of approaching those cloud cloud costs. Huh? The FinOps framework, which we are going to dive in now, is exactly what it is. It is a, a umbrella framework that goes over these different frameworks of the different clouds. Every cloud provider has his way of uh, doing cost optimization, has their tools to do cost optimization. The FinOps framework tells you why uh, you should do it and what you should do in certain, in certain things. So let's, uh, with no further ado, dive into this uh, FinOps framework. Now, what is this FinOps framework? Well, let's start with the definition. I mean, the definition as such, um, I tried to put a couple of words in bold here, but I ended up with a completely bold written de definition. So I just decided to remove all the bold here. But FinOps is an operational framework, which is a very inter interesting one. It's operationally and a cultural practice. And what we are trying to do is maximize the business value of your cloud. Every cloud you have at customers, we try to maximize the business value for the customer. What should be enabled is timely, timely as in today, tomorrow, we should have the data so we can make data-driven decisions and create a 
uh, a culture of accountability, financial accountability, but collaboration as well between engineering, finance, and business. Remember, these are the three actors I talked about earlier on. So this definition, this definition is basically how the Finos Foundation put it together. And it's, I think, a, a, a definition which, which is still um, uh, very well uh, welcomed in the world of cloud. Now, of course, without, with a definition only, this would be a very short framework. So we also have some guiding principles where we say, okay, these six, um, I will run over them one by one, and teams need to collaborate. Looking at the challenges, teams need to collaborate and they need to be aware of what one person is doing compared to the other one. It is super important that you try to create some sort of um, Google Translate layer between everybody, that everybody understands the same um, things under the same statements. And for example, if we say, a reserved instance that everybody knows. Oh yeah, reserved instance. Okay, this this mechanism in the cloud where you reserve certain instances. Or if we say saving plan uh, for EC2, for example, that they know. Oh yeah, it's a more flexible framework or a more flexible plan, but for compute and so on and so on. So teams need to collaborate. Every team, finance, business, technical, they are all talking about the same thing in their own way, which is uh, creating complexity, and you could easily remove it by. Creating some sort of yeah general lexicon where you can uh, where you can push things forward. Decisions are driven on the business value of cloud. The business value of cloud could be faster time to market, uh, faster development, um, could be cheaper, could be whatever. Uh, it could be whatever whatever um, um, decision that you take, but it should be based on the on the business value of cloud. If you decide to let your non production workloads run twenty four seven. Fine, but you need to validate the value that that brings because in many cases, non-production test environment and so on doesn't really make sense to run them 24-7. Everyone takes ownership of their cloud usage. For me, it's super important. There is in many cases, um, management looks at operational teams. They need to look at their cloud usage. No, the management needs to be aware of everything, needs to be uh, included in certain conversations, need to have a high-level idea on where the money is flowing towards. Right? FinOps data should be accessible and timely. For me, this is the cornerstone of your FinOps practice. If you don't have your data ready and accessible by tomorrow, the data of today, you have a problem today or tomorrow. The problem with not having FinOps data is your decision time is delayed by X amount of time. And of course, you cannot, for example, on an anomaly that is happening now, you cannot do anything anymore on this anomaly. It is, it is happening now and you should act now. This is something that is uh, very important uh, in many cases, but also, for example, a an, uh, an not covered uh, or not well covered RI, for example, is also something that you need to have you need to have the idea or at least the, 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 the data to take a decision on this tomorrow, because if you wait for one month, you are losing money potentially. A centralized team should drive FinOps. I'm not stating that a centralized team is responsible of everything in FinOps. A centralized team drives FinOps and pushes accountability to the outside, for example, to DevOps teams and so on. Of course, we have also a Belgian reality, and the Belgian reality is certain customers are relatively small. So which team are you talking about? And in many cases, it's a virtual team that does the migration efforts towards the cloud. And those guys become responsible in operations. And those people inside those teams should act and also include FinOps in their day-to-day -day work. Take advantage of all the variable cost models of cloud. Of course, if you look at, at AWS and, and all the others, um, you will get proposals. You can cut your cost minus 40%, minus 60%. Let's do it. What they are not telling you is that you need to get yourself into a reserved instance for three years and you might need to pay upfront, which is something where they lock you in, which is maybe not an issue, but you are unable to quickly adapt certain things in the cloud. Of course, you can exchange, for example, a certain um, reserved instance, for example, you can do that but it's always a burden management to do that. So you can take advantage of all those variable cost models, but you need to make sure that you are on top of your game when you, when you put that practice um, out there. There is a full strategy that you could um, give a customer, but every customer is rather unique in his way of approaching this, the way they want to take risks and so on. 
it, they are all a bit unique, so you need to take into account all the uniqueness of a certain customer. All right. Let's dive into the different domains. Different domains um, are four groups, I would say, um, where later on I will also put the capabilities under this. And you see this is four domains. I will not take too long. Understand cloud costs, uh, cloud usage and costs, so understanding what it is, quantifying your business value, optimizing cloud usage and cost, and then managing the FinOps practice. Now, this might not tell everything to you, but this might be a bit of an extra push to this. Under these domains, we have different capabilities. In total, you will see plus 20 capabilities. Um, and you have, a, um, for example, a data ingestion and allocation, for example, reporting and anal analytics and anomaly management in your first domain. Why are they there? If you don't get the data, if you don't get the allocation right, you are unable to do any analytics and normally management is what is my workload doing, right? Quantify the business value. If you are unable to quantify what a certain workload will bring to you, you are probably not using clouds in the, yeah, the best form, right? If you don't do planning, if you don't do any estimation, if you you cannot do any forecasting, you cannot do any budgeting, you cannot do anything in that world, right? But you can also not benchmark one team against the other, right? For example, the Nirvana and not the group, but the oasis I would say where we try to get to is the unit economics is link a business metric, for example, the amount of subscriptions we sell um, to, a, uh, to, to the end user, linked to a cloud cost. Uh, look, for example, take the, take the example of Netflix or Spotify. Their, their business is to sell us um, these subscriptions. And depending on where you are in the, in, the, uh, um, in the organization, you will get a question, drop the cloud cost by minus 20%. And in the other office, that same CFO that asked you the question about the minus 20% will go into another office to pat the shoulders of all the sales because they did a very good job in selling more subscriptions. Problem is that IT got the question minus 20%, but if their, sell, if their sales went up, I don't know, by, uh, by 40, 50% and their cloud cost stayed controlled, then actually IT did a very good job in controlling the cost per subscription, right? That's where you want to go to is a cost per business unit. Uh, so not business unit, but a, a metric inside your business. For example, it could be a lifetime value of a customer. Uh, how much did a customer spend with us and what's the link to cloud? Which is an, it's not an exercise you can do tomorrow if you start. This is an exercise a customer needs to grow towards. Optimizing cloud cost and usage is architecting for cloud. I look back to that frugal architect. Architecting for cloud is a new capability since this uh, update of the framework. Workload optimization, licensing and SaaS. I look back to the Ola, for example, for AWS, where they also do licensing optimization and they bring stuff in there. Licensing is now a part of this, uh, of this framework. Rate optimization is taking advantage of all the rate differences inside the different cloud. Cloud sustainability, also a name in the market that is known as GreenOps. Uh, so we, we link uh, the financial part, the services, the instances part, and sustainability together. And for example, if you are able to cut, um, for example, 50% uh, of the CPU of a certain instance by moving to another one, you might also have removed pieces of your carbon footprint in this, uh, in this story. Manage FinOps practice is something wherever all the management goes in, right? So the FinOps, of the, uh, FinOps practice operations, education enablement to build a culture, cloud policy and governance, making sure there is stuff written, but also adhere to and make sure that everybody complies to the policy. Invoicing, internal and chargeback. The FinOps assessment, I will talk about that later on. Onboarding workloads and uh, also FinOps tools and services and intersecting disciplines. For example, licensing and SaaS might be also an intersecting discipline depending on the maturity of your customer. Now, if I look at this, this is the whole framework. And I can imagine for you, this might look like this. Right? This looks like a very big wall to climb, uh, and I, I hear you completely, and I want to break this down in the rest of the presentation in how you could, or the rest of the presentation, a, couple, a slide or four or five, I think, um, where, we, um, where we can start small but dream in a bigger, in a bigger way, right? So, all fun and games, but where do we start? Every customer is different, as I said before, so there is, for me, 
a, a circle where you go through is define your scope, you analyze it, you optimize it, you work on an accountability culture, which also executes, you supervise and then iterate on your scope and you go, it's a merry-go-round or a roundabout, whatever you want to call it, but you go into a circle multiple times through this. Now, for every piece, I have created a slide which gives you a bit more information on how to, or at least a bit more um, idea on how to create this. All right, define your ideal scope. If you are unaware of your um, maturity, I would say, and if a customer starts, you could assume the maturity is zero. But don't be surprised, some of the practices of, of FinOps are relatively fast in place. So some customers might advance in certain domains or certain capabilities a bit faster than others. So most of them um, have a similar fingerprint, unique fingerprint, but there is a lot of um, similar ways to approach the same problem, right? Um, then of course, focus on what is relevant for your customer. If things are irrelevant for your customer, don't push it. If you don't, if they don't want to move to a unit economic or maybe not yet, move it to the higher piece of the maturity. And if they're really leading and they have time to do this, let them do that at that point. Define a maturity roadmap. Define a maturity roadmap is um, in, in FinOps terms, we, we talk about crawl, walk and run. I tend to add at the very first step, a pre-crawl where there is nothing in place. Uh, you're basically a baby um, laying in their bed just like this and, and they are unable to do anything. Um, where crawling is a bit more yeah, active, I would say, walking and running, of course, as well. The last state is flying, uh, which in many cases customers don't get to, but they like to see that this is something where we can move towards and we can, we can in, a, in a distant future, we can go there. And then, of, co of course, uh, as what I said before, include relevant stakeholders from the start. If you are unable to bring people to the table, and that doesn't need to be a lot, eh? it could be um, a couple of managers, but also people from finance and a couple of, uh, of uh, more operational people. If you bring those people together, you will be most of the time uh, surprised by the amount of information you will get, but also how they learn stuff from others. For example, I was doing a maturity assessment a couple of, I think it's almost a year ago, I did, I did that one. And there was a finance person in the room, which was very silent. And at one point, we touched the chargeback topic, where the operational guys and all of those people said, well, we don't have chargeback, where the finance people, finance person looked up and said, no, 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 we have it. But you are unaware of how we are dividing the cost inside our company. So if you have those people in the room, you learn a thing or two from your own organization. And with you as a as a starting point, learn something from that customer as well. Now, the maturity assessment, in many cases, uh, the cloud providers themselves do have some sort of maturity assessment, which is very light most of the time. Also, the Finnips Foundation has a maturity assessment, which is also rather light. It's only six capabilities strong, I think. If you know that there is 22 or 23, um, yeah, of course, you you are yeah, potentially missing out on, uh, on some of these, uh, these areas, right? All right, analyze and optimize. Uh, find answers to common questions. Um, do we really need all these snapshots? Uh, do we need snapshots from 2022 if we're running today? I think everybody might understand this, that this might not be a good idea. Um, do we need to store all of our data on those high performance disks? They are just 20, 30, 40, 50% more expensive than a yeah, normal performing disk. If your application is not pushing the limits of it, why should you have a high performance disk? If like your uh, if your instance is like uh, thumb rolling like this, yeah, why should you move? Why shouldn't you move to another instance type, right? Also, application life cycling. How long will this application stay? Will it stay for the next year? Because then I could potentially um, go for a reserved instance if that one is running at uh, 80, 90 percent workload. Why not, right? Uh, will we util utilize the same set of resources? Aren't we planning to upgrade it or to move it to serverless or whatever? Um, why is this compute instance so big? If what I just said, if it's thumb rolling, why should you do it, right? Um, do we need to store all the logs for X amount of time? In many cases, I've seen this. In many cases, they store logs for 90 days, 120 days, even longer on the high-performing um, uh, logging architecture, which in my view, 
doesn't really make sense because what are you going to do with a log that is, I would say, outdated um, or is there for 120 days? Shouldn't you move it to a less performing uh, architecture that if you need to query it, you can still query it, but it will go slower? Why not, right? How can we reduce, for example, Kubernetes uh, idle time? And so you have the Kubernetes uh, cluster. There's a lot of idle time in there. How could we reduce this? We need a conversation with your application teams. Um, are we getting the right value for our money uh, out of this setup of resources? And then also, are the same team involved? Uh, for example, if a well-performing team is in involved, you could pull them in to cross-teach, for example, or if a new team comes in, you could uh, do enablement sessions to make sure that that is an, uh, yeah, that we can push things forward in a controlled way, right? And then on the right side of the slide, um, that is uh, be inspired by the cloud adoption frameworks. Everybody has it. Um, and uh, I told, uh, talked about the uh, well-architected framework. Also a cloud adoption framework uh, includes most of the time uh, cost uh, um, perspectives as well. And then define workloads for optimization and execute. And don't go too long into certain cycles on can we or can't we or what's the story and how. Try to move forward one step at a time. Make sure that we show the value of what the FinOps stuff is doing. Um, define, of course, if you don't have any reporting, a first iteration of reporting. If you don't have that, you are you're flying blind. There is no radar screen, right? So define that first iteration of reporting. And then think about achievable KPIs. Don't put the bar too high. Work towards a crawl bar, a walk bar, and a run bar. And the run bar can be very far away, but nevertheless, try to aim for it. And that KPI can support uh, the, the measurability of your actions. All right. Work on accountability structure. I think that's super important. But you need to understand that not every action will have the same impact. Uh, what fits the culture of your company? Uh, formal learning, for example, or do we do something which is more fun? Uh, so, uh, for example, I did a FinOps hackathon um, at, a, at a customer in Portugal um, where, where they, we basically put the fun into FinOps, right? Um, are we going to police around, which is also a possibility? But how many, how much buy-in do you get from people where you police towards and you always start showing the, the, the finger and you say, no, 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 you need to do it like this. It, it will work in a very fast way, but in the longer term, it might not work, right? And of course, connect money to something that is closer to the heart of engineers. Um, because I believe that an engineer is always there to do the right thing for the organization he or she is working for. But of course, bringing in money is something that is very far away from, from, um, from, from, from their story, from their heart, I would say, from what they are lying awake from. I believe that in some cases it might be, and it's not all cases, but in some cases it might be interesting, for example, to link it to something that is closer to the heart of an engineer. For example, uh, the amount of carbon footprint that they um, removed um, from, um, from, the, from the cloud, from resources in the cloud, but they it equals some sort of carbon footprint uh, that they uh, removed. Huh? How cool is it that you can go home and have dinner at, uh, in the evening where you could go in and say to your kids, hey, kids, today I uh, removed um, at my work um, our carbon footprint um, for, um, from our uh, family from the cloud. So we are now uh, running uh, carbon free or at least uh, four of us or uh, the many you are, we could uh, we could uh, now run carbon free or I removed it from the from the cloud. It is something that might trigger some people, might not trigger people, which is of course also a possibility. All right, work on accountability, also expose all the teams towards um, uh, FinOps, as I said before. Tailor your approach to different stakeholders. Not every stakeholder is doing the same or understanding the same things. For example, if you're an executive, you don't want the details. You want to get to the point. Uh, but an engineer might um, yeah, um, react on certain things differently, right? Um, include tech, business, and finance teams. I cannot push on that enough. Um, set up touch points with those different teams. If you have different teams looking after an application or after soft pieces of software, Set up regular touch points with these teams so you are on top of what they're doing and you can understand why certain things are happening. And of course, look for um, continuous support top down as uh, so executive buying. 
And then all fun and games, but supervise and iterate. The iteration is coming into, into this uh, story from a crawl, walk, and run. You cannot do everything at once, so focus on the things you can do. Um, if you put uh, all the capabilities in the in the under and the, the foundational layer at the very beginning, it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense because you cannot focus on 22 things at once. You should focus on a couple of things and mature in that and pick your battles while you're doing it. It also allows you to iterate on your scope and to go in those in that different circle. All right. Any questions in the Q&A, Dan? I don't know. No questions so far, Stan. Thank you. Okay, cool. Good stuff. Then we can jump into the pitfalls. Well, I, I, I put this here, but uh, let's go out for the pitfalls. Eight of them are, uh, are next. And um, this one is an interesting one. I see it in every customer. How much did we save? Well, we did save, but savings is not the product of FinOps. Savings is a byproduct of good FinOps work, right? So don't confuse cost savings with cost avoidance, for example. If you could measure a cost saving, for example, uh, I removed uh, pieces in the cloud and it gave me 1,000 euros back in my monthly, uh, my monthly invoice. I mean, we saved it, so it's no, no longer there. Uh, so we dropped the cost. But how are you going to measure an engineer that gets a request and says, we don't need to run this workload with these instances? And he makes a proposal on how to run it more efficiently and then deploys it. It might look like something obvious, but in many cases, customers don't see this. They look at the reporting and they say, hey, the reporting is showing a, a flat trend or maybe a bit downwards. But what happens in the back end is that people are starting to reflect on these things. So savings are not a focus point. It is the, the, the cost avoidance, the culture around your cloud that makes a difference, right? Tagging is so overrated. I mean, in many cases, actually, actually every customer that I mean has some sort of tagging. In many cases, it's a technical approach to tagging. The problem is that your reporting should not be technical. You should be able to keep people accountable for what they are spending. So how are you going to keep people accountable for what they're spending if you only have technical measures? For example, a backup policy or a updating policy or whatever. I mean, okay, fine, or a production or development, all fun and games, but which piece of the business are you supporting? If you're supporting a certain business unit with this application, of course, the technical measures, for example, test, dev, and all of that stuff can be helpful to see, okay, application A, has this amount in depth, this amount in test, this amount in production. Okay, we can now see what the total amount of this application or this business unit costs. What many customers neglect is the business part of tagging. And that is actually the stronghold to link it at one point to, your, um, to a unit inside your business. A question that I get many times from executives is, are we there yet? Are we already in the run state? The problem is, and that's uh, an interesting debate you can uh, you can have about with a customer is, um, there are no runners uh, in this state. There is no, what I mean with that is, there is no consistent runners. Whatever happens in the world, whatever happens in your organization might change the, the maturity where you are. Uh, for example, um, let's take an, an, an actual um, um, uh, Example, um, if you would run a FinOps um, practice two years ago, almost three years ago in Ukraine, and all of a sudden you're in the middle of a war, you can be in a run state, but the economy will push you back to a crawl state or to, to a walk state. Why? Because people might be leaving, people uh, yeah, leave the scene basically. So you have a, a knowledge drain and new people that come in. Yeah, they don't know what's going on. So from an, uh, from certain pieces in the in the framework, you might be in a run state, but for all the others, you might be thrown back into a crawl or in a walk state. So it's a bit, maybe a bit of an extreme uh, and, uh, uh, story, but uh, but let's, for example, take COVID. A Belgian customer, they uh, did for a, a cost cutting at that moment in time, they, uh, did, they had a gigantic drain of people, same story. Um, the people went away, and right now, when the when the economy is back on track, they're trying to pull in new people, but it's all new people. So the 
the knowledge of the organization, the unique fingerprint of the organization is gone. So you need to rebuild that. So we are never in a consistent run state, but of course, what you need to do is focus on the state and the progress instead of focusing on the, on the, the real state and eh, the run state. All right. This is something interesting. In many cases, I've seen this, uh, Stan, which tool do you advise? And I say, well, it doesn't really matter if you throw a, a tool at the problem, if you don't know how to, how to create a value out of the data that that tool is showing, you're still not doing anything, right? So your processes need to be aligned with that cloud operation, right? So it stands, it's, it's there, a fool with a tool is still a fool if you have, don't have the skills there to work with the tool, if you don't have the skills to create reports and create actions on this, you're nowhere. So is a tool a good thing? Maybe, maybe not. In many cases, a Kudos dashboard will help you a long way before you even need to introduce a tool. Recently, we have I've, had, I've worked in a customer where we introduced a tool. Why? Because the data consistency problem was a real big issue. Why? Because many customers or many clouds, sorry, uh, were reporting or exporting the data in a different format. So the normalizing and all of that of the data was a big problem. Right at this point, there is uh, ways to work around uh, this. You might have seen it in the beginning. I also have a batch on focus analyst. Focus is the language of FinOps in the meantime, where we have some sort of open standard, open standard billing, um, uh, open billing standard. So it helps, but it's of course not a, a perfect solution because not all um, data is in there at this point. The most relevant data is in there. All right. Also, um, <laughs> That guy in the corner, you see there, that's our FinOps guy. That should be enough. And of course, um, yes, as I said before, it's one central team that needs to run it. If it's one person, it's one person, but it's a team sport. So a central team needs to drive FinOps, but everyone in that story is accountable for the success of FinOps and cloud. Uh, because FinOps as such is, a, is one thing, one, one aspect of, of cloud, but it's not the cloud migration in, in a whole, right? So this is something... Um, which is for me something interesting to see is that that guy is doing FinOps. He's a bit of a weird guy, like the DevOps guys earlier on. That guy is also a weird guy. Um, so same story again comes up and is a, is something that you need to be aware of. That it's a team sport, and if you're sitting in a corner as one person, you're not on the right spot. You need to talk to everybody, right? All right, we are five pitfalls far. This one is a big one. If you don't have any executive buy-in, there is no FinOps success. If your leadership is not supportive of this FinOps story, you can do whatever you want, but a, a push-up from the, from the bottom to the, to, to the upper layers is super, super difficult if you come from an a engineering point of view. The, also, maybe a team leader. If you roll it up, somebody is feeling the pain of overspending. And that's most of the time in the higher echelons of an organization. Executive buy-in at that point is super important. If somebody feels the pain in the budgeting and every year again, they have, they, they have the pain of the budgets and they see the budget going up out of control, plus 10, plus 20, plus 30 percent, and nobody knows where the money is going, you might have found somebody that has the, the problem, <laughs> I would say. So this is something super important. Super important, I cannot stress it enough. Um, if you don't have executive buy-in, you have no FinOps success. Sure. But of course, if you neglect to, um, to train your troops, I would say you also have no progress. And training doesn't need to be formal training, but it could be exposing certain teams or certain team members to FinOps. And for example, in the hackathon, what I did is at one, mo at one point we had a, I think it was three, three presentations. And one of the presentations was what is FinOps? What is this framework we, we talk about? What is this stuff? It is just exposing people to that, but also at that point, make it concrete and say, okay, these are the savings we're going to focus on. These are the domains we're going to focus on. These are the tagging, uh, the tagging strategy we're going to focus on to make sure we get more relevant data um, available to make better decisions in the long run. Right? So it's basically also um, no exposure to FinOps is no progress, right? And also, this is an important one. Um, I've seen I've seen uh, seen so many customers that don't automate cloud, and um, not automating cloud means it is super error heavy. Uh, if you don't have any um, Terraform or or uh, or Bicep or whatever in your in your environment, 
it might be super difficult in the long run to automate it still, right? Because at that moment in time, you created so much, pardon my, my words, but uh, so much shit in the cloud that you are unable to control it again. So if you start automating from the beginning, you are avoiding the click ops mentality and you will never be in a situation where you are, uh, where you need to run existing workloads back into an automation framework, which is, a, as they say, a shit out, shit in problem. You will have a non-automated uh, environment coming into some, some automation with that, which at one point, yeah, will, will break something at one point. And it is something that is not, um, yeah, you don't want to break something in production, for example. Huh? So, for example, if there is a moment where there is an, um, where there is an, uh, let's talk about SAP, for example, if you have an SAP upgrade coming in, it might be the moment because at that point you roll out new instances, new databases, all of that to move, for example, certain, certain uh, SAP components inside those new instances. That might be the moment to roll out a complete automation to make sure that you start with a clean slate from uh, that moment onwards. All right, 30 minutes left. Okay, we could wrap up and we could open it up for uh, for um, uh, uh, questions and so on. So wrapping it up, what I want you to take away from today is uh, FinOps is a collaborative effort. I mean, it's a team sport and it is not something you can do in your corner. I hope that is something that crossed from my end to your end. You cannot do in your corner, impossible. Uh, you need to have a a virtual team or people around you that are your stakeholders where you can talk to and people that are also willing to act on certain things. You have now seen the introduction of the whole framework, including also some, some way to, for example, go to the well-architected framework and so on. But don't be overwhelmed. Start with a small thing. Start, for example, with making sure your tagging is okay and you have a basic reporting engine. And from that moment on, you can start iterating on your, on your processes. You can pull in new capabilities into the, into the iteration. From that moment on, you can move, uh, move further. Also, focus a bit on immediate wins because, of course, everybody wants to see some wins because otherwise it does not really... Uh, um, calculate in the right way. So the better you could do that, the, the, the more um, buy-in you will get. Once you have the buy-in, you can scale up, but also your cloud is not a snapshot of today. It is something that is constantly moving. So you should be able to, um, to go um, to scale up together with the cloud users, right? So your governance, your policy should be ready to do that. Tagging and cost visibility is key. Yeah, that's what I just said. Make sure, for example, if you start small, that you could start with a bit of tagging. You could just add a couple of, uh, for example, business units. You could add the business units to certain, uh, certain workloads. That business units you could then show back in a report. This is what you're using, guys. You don't need to act on it, but I give you visibility. Most of the time when you create visibility, you get questions. How could we reduce this? Thank you for your insight, but hey, hold on a second. Um, we see this. We, we see something different. Help us explain this. Okay, cool. Let's 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 have a conversation. From that moment on, you are collaborating, right? Automate from the start. I think I made the point in the, one of the previous slides. But um, while clicking around in the console can be very fun, right? It could be you can spin up whatever you want, but automate your deployments from the start. And it is really. Um, a big issue if, if you have, for example, a 100K or 200K per month, ClickOps related uh, cloud environment, it is super difficult to get back on your feet uh, in, 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 the, in the longer run. And also FinOps is a continuous journey. It is not a, I always compare it with a sprint and a marathon. It's, it's, a, it's a marathon. No, it's an ultra run where you are the, I don't know if everybody knows him, but Karel Sabo, he runs like uh, whole, whole borders and he runs for 8,000 kilometers in a couple of, uh, in a couple of, uh, yeah, a dozen or hundred days, whatever. But he does, what he does is basically there is some sort of end point, but tomorrow I'm back running. I'm, tomorrow, well, after his feet are healed, I suppose, but most of the time, they just continue to run, right? They just continue the, the journey. And it's not for the sake of making savings. It's for the sake of uh, making a better control decision, making a better data-driven decision, making whatever possible in your, in your environment. All right. That brings me to the Q&A section of this. Any questions so far? Type them now in the Q 
Q&A piece and we can, um, we I, I try to pull them up on my screen. Um, there are at this point no open questions. I might have a question or at least something I've, I'm working on at this point is budgeting. It's the time of the year. Um, and budgeting is something interesting because if you have an uncontrolled cloud environment, you are almost unable to forecast and to budget in the right dimension, right? So any ideas, that's something you can put in the chat, any ideas on how to approach budgeting? Don't be too shy. If you don't type anything, also good, I can give you another example. Okay, some of us are maybe still typing. We're not going to wait until everything is there. If there's if there is something popping up in the chat, I'll take it. Um, also, another thing is, for example, onboarding of workloads. Something is which is very interesting in many cases is, um, and also something you could start on from the very beginning. And um, still eight minutes left, but what I how I compare it most of the time of the onboarding of workloads is going through some sort of airport security check. Uh, everybody can imagine being on an airport, right? And you want to take a plane that's making it not too difficult inside Europe, so you don't need to go through extra border controls and stuff like that, but only the security. If you look at security, what they do is they scan your bag, and if there are fluids in there, there is bigger, what is it now, 100 milliliters, and you cannot have 10 more than 10 uh, pieces of it in your backpack, um, they will just push the backpack out. They will ask you, hey, um, you have 11 pieces in your uh, in your backpack, some uh, one needs to go, and with a bit of bit of bit of luck, you have your friends or your kids with you, and you put it in their bag. But if you're alone, you yeah, you need to throw away something, right? It's the same with onboarding of workloads. You should do your due diligence before it enters the cloud. Same thing, like on an airport, you do your due diligence before you um, you go on a plane, right? Because let's assume you are um, you are bringing bringing for example a knife to this uh, to the airport, and you in one way or another you manage to get through security and you go onto the on, onto the airplane and you pull out a knife, not to do something but to peel your uh, your apple for example. How is how are people going to react? Uh, same thing with a cloud workload. If you bring something in the cloud that is not gone through all the due diligence, once it's there, it's rather impossible to still remove that running workload from the cloud. Because at that point, you're running, or in this case, you're flying. So you're flying in the air. How are you going to remove the person with a knife from the, air, from the airplane? It's impossible. So you will need to strap him on a, on a seat, making sure that person stays where he is. And he doesn't he cannot do anything um, wrong anymore, right? For a workload, for example, when it's already onboarded in the cloud without any due diligence, the problem you get is that in many cases, right sizing becomes an issue because yeah, you have a running workloads. So you cannot mid-flight change the engine of your of your of your running running workload. So you need to have a change trajectory and so on that needs to uh, needs to be followed and so on. So if you do your due diligence, sorry way up front, it makes um, your work lighter afterwards. Same thing, your due diligence could be, which tagging do we put on these workloads? All of that helps you in the longer run to make sure we are not um, yeah, fighting a flood or fighting something that is there without, um, yeah, without proper value or without proper properly bringing something back to you. All right, in the meantime, I hope I could keep everybody awake, but there is nothing in the chat at this point. Um, if you would like to connect, we could always connect. That's not an issue. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can send me an email or you can read my blog. Depends um, which of the uh, which of the three doesn't matter. Um, if there is anything, of course, I think Dan also uh, has my contact details. So you could always uh, get back to, uh, to me. Um, for me, this concludes the story. I'm not sure if there is any questions. Drop me an email, drop Dan an email. We'll manage, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. So thank you very much, and um, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, Stan, for joining us and giving you giving us your insights concerning FinOps. Thank you so much.
no problem.